welcome to Explore, Explain, Highlights. In this Highlights package, we'll be looking at Season 3, Episode 4, with our guests, Lisa Wanannan jones and Eleanor Lutz, discussing the project A Guide for COVID-19 Risk in Your County. I mean, the project has shifted a number of times over the past, um, you know, what's now over a year uh, to meet the demands of that moment. I mean, the information needs have changed, the data availability has changed. And so at the very beginning, you know, this started with um, a single spreadsheet monitored by really just one reporter or a couple reporters. It, then it started growing and growing. And, um, you know, that whole operation has had to change um, as those numbers increased. And then it really did come to a point where we said, you know, just counting is not enough. We need to be able to do more. And um, through the whole year, too, a, a number of our colleagues have done really great one off graphics interpreting different moments throughout the pandemic. Um, but the risk levels was the first comprehensive daily updated project that does that level of guidance and interpretation. I think I got brought in in the early days when it was um, really a, a top down decision, really no question at all that we were going to collect county level data. And that was a hugely ambitious um, thing, but no one even really talked about it that way. That was just necessary to tell the story. And I think that's really um, played out in a lot of ways since, including the risk project, that if we don't have that county level um, granularity, and we've even collected zip code data in some cases as well, um, that we needed that to be able to tell the story properly. And um, that's something that's like, really matters to me because I live in a small county. And mm. ordinarily, a lot of my life is around local news and um, visual representations and rural coverage. And so I, you know, while I knew that initially some of the big cities were were places where there were big outbreaks, we needed to have that ability to, to tease out the smaller stories too. It's not an exaggeration to say that this may be the biggest data event in our lifetimes. You know, the, the global reach, the, the number of people affected both as you know part of the data counts but also affected by what those mean to them it's it, it it's hard to imagine something that will be com comparable and with that there's so many different aspects that i think are interesting around you mentioned there about sort of public or like a public service public duty that the the times and it certainly seemed to take that on very early on in the pandemic maybe to fill the void or the vacuum of various levels of authority or the, the, the government sort of stepping in to provide that. Um, but as we talked about before, it's, it's, it's a shift in perspective that's trying to translate to help people cope with this. But on the note of data and the data kind of consistency and reliability, I recall maybe around this time last year speaking with John Byrne Murdoch at the Financial Times, who was doing his very popular, certainly in the UK, trajectory. Uh, plots and he was you know working day in day out to ring round correspondents to confirm and validate and verify numbers but knowing that these would be good enough rather than perfect now I'm thinking again back to you Lisa for this you know you'll have experienced the frustrations the gaps the hair tearing out moments of handling this data but how do you walk that tightrope of data that is good enough isn't perfect and you've got you know the, the, the responsibility journalism wise to make sure that there is integrity but you also know that this number it's not going to get any better so why why not still go ahead with it how would you sort of walk that tightrope really yeah i think um there's definitely still places i could say like i know their data is not as good as it should be and that bothers me a lot Uh, one of the main hurdles we were trying to overcome is that the Centers for Disease Control had, had published all of this type of guidance, but they had published it in a very long form descriptive way. Mm. And we, we wanted to translate that into shorter sections that would apply directly to people's everyday lives. So can I go to the grocery store? Uh, can I see my friends and mm. family? Uh, so shortening it, but but still retaining the accuracy was, was definitely the most difficult part of writing the guidance and 
uh, there was a lot of back and forth with the epidemiologists and the, the communications experts. Um, we, we sent a lot of documents back and forth, full of comments, full of notes. Obviously, over the last year, there has been so much produced graphically about this topic, not just by the MIT, but every single newsroom is looking at the same kind of thing. And obviously, there are certain techniques that have emerged that have kind of coalesced around the same thing. And we'll talk shortly about the the bar chart with the, the sort of moving average as a very established common technique. But to what degree, and again, I know that you are answering on behalf of the whole team, so you may not have the, the true insight for this, but to what degree are you thinking about the pressures of doing something different to what others have done out there, to not replicating what the Washington Post may be doing, or even the Financial Times or, the, or Reuters? Are you aware of trying to differentiate? And I know we talked about the, the public service and trying to enhance what the CDC perhaps are, are doing, but in terms of what let's call it competitors, is there a need to find a, a way to differentiate from what they are, they are doing? Well, from the from a data perspective, I, I'd say we really try very hard to find the most um, understandable and accurate way of presenting the data. Uh, in this case, what we're using for the risk calculations. So I, I think that's the question I, I try to think about the most mm. is this is the data we've decided is is the most relevant or what we need to show for this. How can we make it as less confusing as possible? Mm. Um, and, and certainly there are, uh, we, we look at examples of like great data visualizations from uh, lots of other topics and areas. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that we're necessarily saying like, oh, we need to do something different just mm. because it's different. Yeah, and of course, you know, the, that pressure exists for all sorts of things like the election coverage, you know, there's, there's a desire to do what you want to do, but also just a little voice in the background saying, well, how do we make this stand out from the rest of, of, of people as well? But just, just coming to you on that point then, Lisa, have you, have you got a, a sense or insight on that as well? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that we watch what other news organizations are doing. And probably the most interesting thing about this project is that it's also not just news organizations. I mean, we've been in touch with some of the groups that are doing you know, risk dashboards and other mm -hmm. types of visualizations. And that world has kind of expanded, which is kind of cool. Um, and, uh, you know, definitely we keep an eye on it, but um, I think I think there's, it's been interesting to watch the iterative process from the design side and seeing how people are working through these ideas. And um, especially given that everybody's been working remote, like you can kind of right. follow along, you can follow yeah. along on Slack. And even if you're not really in the conversation, you can see like how it's evolving. And so that's been really fun. And um, I think while everybody's mindful of wanting to you know, stay within the bounds of what people expect. I don't think there's too much concern about trying to to really differentiate. I think everyone's much more focused on is this the best version that we can do right now and today? And, you know, then maybe afterward you look around and see what everybody else is doing. Thank you for joining us for this Explore, Explain, Highlights episode. As always, the full episode is available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. We hope to see you again soon on another episode of Explore, Explain.